Um, uh, good evening. Welcome to the ITN English Debate Workshop with uh, Miko Vituk. Hopefully, I'm not pronounce it wrong, and sorry if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, firstly, I would like to say thank you for all of, uh, all of the participants' enthusiasm to registering this workshop. And here, as you know from the pamphlet that we had shared almost like literally everywhere, the workshop will be talked about enriching and utilize uh, your method bag. So uh, there are several things that I think that you guys need to note on before we start the workshop. Uh, firstly, there will be a documentation uh, session before the workshop starts. So please turn on your camera if you don't have any uh, connection issue because we want to take a screenshot of the participant. Second, notice uh, of the abundance amount of the participants. So if you have any question, there will be a Q&A Google form and that will be answered after each part of the workshop material shared uh, just to make it conducive. So, and I, as a moderator, will pick the real type of question within the materials. The pattern will be like this. There is like the first part of the materials, like 30 minutes, and then like there are going to be 15 minutes of uh, Q&As and then continuing the second parts of the materials and 15 minutes of Q&A and so on. And lastly, uh, there will be a Google form of attendance in the middle of the event, and it will be shared in the chat box. Uh, I really highly encourage you guys to fill it because it will be like uh, it will give you a certificate of participation, and also uh, we really need your like advice and criticism through that form as well. So yeah, please pay attention towards the. Google form of the attendance that will be shared by the organizing committee in the middle of uh, event. So uh, I would like to welcoming uh, our fabulous speaker, Miko. Uh, Miko is fourth world best speaker and grand finalist. Uh, Miko is Austra Australasian champion and third best speaker of Australasia, and also three times Asian champion and overall best speaker of Asia. Uh, hello, Miko, are you already here with us? Okay. Uh, hi. How are you, Miko? I'm doing okay. I'm very thankful you guys invited me to speak here. Okay. So because Miko is already here, and I think Miko is already ready. So without any further ado, I giving it the floors to Miko. The floor is yours, Miko. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm just gonna do a bit of a check. Can people see my slides? Uh, I think it's feasible. All right, wonderful. I'll just put it on full screen. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Miko. Um, I'm a debater from Ateneo and I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things today. First is what my process is like for matter loading or how I read, how I search up facts, etc. And then the second part is going to be how I use that in debates. So once you know everything, um, how do you utilize it your best uh, efforts? Um, and it's on those two parts that the uh, the lecture is going to be divided, so questions will be answered uh, after the first part and after the second part. All right. Um, this is how the first part is going to go, just some outline. First thing I'm going to do is talk about some hard truths. So things about matter loading, case filing that I think are true, that we don't like to admit to ourselves. Secondly, I'll explain my approach and how I vote about things. Um, and then this will be a bit more understandable towards, you know, once I get through the lecture. But there are things I'm gonna call easy case filing and hard case filing. And I wanna talk about how often I do each one. Uh, sorry, I think someone's unmuted. Um, I'm gonna talk about how I go through each one and pretty much what my strategy is. So I'm gonna talk about uh, matter loading, case filing. And I, I wanna see reactions on the chat if possible of whether or not you think this is something you find to be true, at least to you. So case filing, uh, I'll, I'll do that in a bit. So I think there's a lot of pressure in debating to want to know everything about the world. And we often think that to be the best debater, we have to endlessly you know, read articles, watch lectures, and just consume information as much as possible, as quick as you can, as long as you can. Um, but when we see other debaters, it gets even more pressuring, right? You start to wonder, how do they know all this stuff? And how come I don't know that? Um, but the truth is, these are unrealistic and unsustainable sometimes when you actually put them in practice. 
because you'll have these bursts of motivation that you want to read everything in the world, you know, but then when you can't do that, you can't keep up, let alone, you know, I'm sure debating isn't the only part of your life. You have family, school, work, and so many other things you're interested in to take care of. So the goal of this lecture is not to give a way in which you could consume as much information as possible to have the most efficient way of case filing, but it's to be able to create a sustainable way of case filing. Meaning you want it to be such that after a week of doing this stuff, you're not going to stop and think, I am so, so tired. You want to build a routine that you can do every day for a few years, as long as you're in debating. And the way you do that is not to just make yourself used to the grind of, of difficult debating, but it's like exercise, right? You want to create a realistic goal for yourself. And you want to do that by building a routine that sometimes you have to push yourself to do, um, but never to the point where you disdain it or you don't enjoy it anymore. Um, because, you know, like exercise, sometimes you see someone that has like the ideal body type and you think, I have to get there. And then you work out for like, you know, a solid week or two. And then you realize it's really hard to get there. And it's hard because you push yourself too much too quickly. And I think the same thing can happen here. Um, there's a lot about the world that you would probably need to know in debating. And you're going to encounter some motions where you are clueless, where you're just drawing inferences. And no matter how much you read, it's just going to happen. Um, the point of this is to increase the amount of information you know, just to make sure it happens less and less each time. Uh, so I think I'm going to go through the hard truths now. Uh, let me know if this is something that you sometimes feel about not loading your case file. So first, case file can be really boring. Um, it's impossible to like every topic in the world. And you will inevitably have to read about things you don't really like. So personally for me, I'm not a big fan of like pop culture in the sense that I'm not very interested in the lives of celebrities. I'm not very interested in uh, you know, famous people at times. I like art, I like music, I like film, but I don't really like the personalities behind them. I just like seeing what I see. Um, and sometimes you need that for debating, right? Sometimes you'll see emotions about influencers and celebrities. Sometimes you'll see emotions about that kind of stuff. And for some people that might be economics, for some people that might be international relations, um, but in truth, you're going to encounter a lot of topics you don't really care about. Second, it can be tiring, right? Sometimes you really enjoy it, but sometimes you do something you enjoy for a good while and then you don't want to do it anymore because it's an effort to read. It's an effort to watch informative videos. Um, and there are a lot of things that you might like, but if you do them too often, you get exhausted. To add on to that, I'm sure debating isn't you know, the only thing in your life. You have family, you have friends, you have hobbies, you have interests. And sometimes it's more tempting to, I don't know, play a game or something you enjoy, watch a movie, not surround yourself with matter loading, case filing all the time. But, but also, a, a lot of case filing just feels bad, right? Like, sure, you want to use this in debate, but then, you know, these are real people, real lives. The news isn't just the tool for you to win. And that can be very exhausting. The fact that you read the news, it's just so many awful things about the world after another. It's a bit disheartening sometimes to case file the matter load in that sense. Third, it can be very overwhelming. Sometimes you have no idea where to start. You don't know how to find out more about a specific topic because it's so complex. There are so many parts. And it's difficult to feel like you can understand all of it. So why start? Um, I don't know. Like Sometimes the mountain is just too tall such that even if you knew you could make it to the top, it just feels like it's not worth the effort. So sometimes case filing can be like that. And my approach is a balance. Um, you have to balance the fact that you have to push yourself sometimes. Sometimes you have to do things you're not super comfortable with. But at the same time, you have to make it easy for yourself. You want to make it sustainable. And what I propose is a mixed model, which is what I talked about earlier. You want easy matter loading and hard matter loading. And you want to be able to mix it. Uh, so what is easy math loading and what's hard math loading? So I think easy math loading is math loading that allows you to understand more about certain topics without accepting effort that is strenuous or too hard. It's things you could do while doing other things. It's things you could do before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning. It's things you can do pretty much without so much effort. And there's hard math loading. It's an active effort. 
So this is something I would say you'd want to be mentally prepared for. It's the stuff when you say, I'll spend an hour or two today dealing with things I want to read for because I have a competition in a week or so. Um, and I'd recommend maybe ramping up that hard math loading if you know you have a competition that's quite soon. Also because the edge core of your competition is probably making motions and they're reading the news as reference. So being able to read the same sources as them in, in some instances can sometimes help you predict the motion, even if it's not you know, all the time and definitely not for all the rounds. You'll hit that one round where you think, thank God I read, and being able to do that. This is matter loading that takes more of your effort, takes more of your time, and therefore I recommend planning it. You want to make sure that you're ready for it, that you're not doing it out of you know, spontaneity. If you want to, that's, there's no problem, right? But doing that too often, I think, can really make yourself break out. Um, so what is easy matter loading, and how do you go about it? Your goal is to absorb information, but not to do it in a way that would expend your energy or make it difficult to sustain. However, this doesn't mean it's passive, right? It's not just putting something on and then doing something else. Maybe you could be doing something else, but you have to be listening. You still have to be taking in some information, but perhaps you're not taking notes. That's fine. Perhaps there are some parts of it you're not fully listening to. That's fine. Um, just make sure that it's something that is still valuable to you and that you're extracting information from it still. Um, and here are my tips for easy matter loading. These are ways to make it such that it's just part of your daily life. Um, I, when, once I started adopting these tactics, at first, I wasn't very convinced. I thought I was being unproductive. But now, what I end up doing is I watch at least like three to four hours of informational content a day. Um, and I thought that was impossible, right? It seems like a lot. Um, but I wanted to, you know, it's something you ease yourself into. You don't feel it immediately. But once you start doing some of these techniques, in a few months' time, maybe in a year's time, you realize you're consuming information and it doesn't feel so abrasive. Like it's just a part of your life. And to be honest, like my, my YouTube screen time is a bit too much for the average person, I would say. Um, but at least what I'm doing is I'm making it productive. Um, and I want to be clear here. I'm going to give some advice to allow matter loading to seep into your daily life. But I also want to make clear, don't make it such that it's crawling into other parts of your life that you enjoy. So for example, I rarely like play games and do this because I really enjoy games and I don't want this to feel like it's taking away from my hobbies, things I enjoy, uh, that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that it's taking up space, but that, that space isn't something that you feel is very important to you. And do it at your own pace and at your own time. Just make sure you're ramping things up as they go along. So tip number one, tune your social media. Social media for me is a huge distraction. I love memes. I am in way too many meme groups. It's fun to just scroll down your social media. And what you want to do is make sure that when you're doing that, um, at least at some points, you are taking in information and it's helping you out. Here's some ways that you can do so. First, set Facebook favorites. This, I think, is one of my favorite tactics because the way what this does is once these pages that you set as favorites post, it goes to the top of your social media newsfeed. And I thought it would be super abrasive. But when I was checking my Facebook, I still see a lot of content from my friends. I still see a lot of funny content, but I also see a lot more information that's very useful for debating. Um, and I think that's helpful because, you know, the stuff you see from your friends, the funny stuff, that is stuff that the algorithm loves. That is stuff that you're always going to see. This is stuff the algorithm doesn't love as much. And because of that, you're not going to see very much of it. So sometimes it's helpful because you just see something and you'll click on it. Heck, you know, it's not ideal, but sometimes you just come across headlines and it's better to have read those headlines rather than not having read them at all. Um, and by doing this, it, it ensures that your newsfeed isn't completely mindless um, because definitely I still enjoy seeing funny and entertaining stuff on Facebook. But sometimes I find myself only looking at funny and entertaining stuff on Facebook. So being able to do this, I think, is a very easy and digestible way of being able to look at your newsfeed. So um, this is on Facebook mobile. Uh, if you guys you know, want instructions, you can take a picture now and see how to go about setting your favorites. So I set my favorites to a bunch of new sites. And honestly, it's not very suffocating. I, I still see a lot of stuff I enjoy. Second. Uh, this is honestly huge for me. I, I, I just, like, before this lecture, I just went down a rabbit hole of an academic I really like. Um, follow academics on Twitter. 
because I find that not only are they you know intelligent, but they point to a lot of resources I would have never heard of. Uh, I'm not sure if it's visible here, but these are two historians, uh, Dr. Joanna Freeman and Kevin Cruz. Um, and I don't want to give a list of academics that I want you guys to follow. But what I would recommend is, one, if you find them on your Twitter feed, scroll through them, see if their political views are okay. Uh, don't follow academics, because not all academics are good, but I think that a lot of them are good. Um, but two, if you read academic papers and they're written by people who are still alive, um, Twitter is a very valuable resource for academics as well because it allows them to share their like, content, the things they write, the things they talk about. And it's really cool because, um, I don't know, I find that academics on Twitter share information, but unlike others, one, they're a lot more willing to point to their sources because that's second nature to them. They will point to the things they've read. They will link to articles they really like. And I think just going through these threads kind of at least assures you these are credible things. These aren't just things people vibe or feel. They'll often back them up with statistics. Or if they have a really long academic paper, what they'll often do is like put screenshots of the most vital parts of those academic papers. So that if you're not in the mood for reading an entire journal, that, that's cool. You will see the highlights of the journal and it'll come from the person who wrote it. So you know they're not taking it out of context or they're trying to misconstrue the information that's there. Um, so whenever you can, uh, try and look for people. And uh, honestly, once you follow a few of them, you'll find more. They're always talking about their colleagues, sharing more information. It's a very useful thing. Um, I'm not sure if I was able to put that here, but I will have a list later of YouTube channels I really like. Um, and I think that's another important thing. Your YouTube algorithm is one that will show you videos you know, based on the stuff that you click. So if you're clicking the same videos over and over and over again, it'll show you very entertaining, very funny videos over and over and over again. So what I'd recommend is just even if you don't enjoy it or enjoy it yet, um, and for the ones you do enjoy, great. Watch as much of their content as possible. Informational um, videos that still have good... Um, I I'd highly recommend YouTubers that are both informational, but also either incorporate humor into like the way they make videos or have an editing style that is very stylistic such that it's fun to watch even if it's entertaining. Um, I'll send an entire list later, but I find that by doing that, you also again get access to the community, but it's easy. All right, uh, the second tip is to use up idle time. So there are a lot of things I do in the day that I'm not really thinking about. Like I'm doing them and I do them all the time, and I'm not doing very much while doing them. I just want to get through them. So what I do to make them more fun is I play a video, I listen to a podcast, I watch something. Uh, definitely not something like that is too hands-on, just because if you're doing something important, like cooking or whatever, you don't want to leave it. Um, but definitely filling up spaces where you don't really have much to think about or do. Um, and it's also important to think about your day, spend some time to yourself. So I don't recommend doing this always, but for even half the time. So my daily routine, for example, I cook for like 45 minutes a day, like my breakfast and lunch, I suppose. I eat alone for around 45 minutes a day. I have dinner with my family a bit later at night. I shower for like half an hour. I go jogging uh, or biking for half an hour. Uh, sometimes, not all the time. And at these times, I find that I end up listening to something anyway, like music, etc. I don't recommend using all this time for matter learning or listening to things, but I would recommend using some of this time for it. Uh, I still find there's a lot of value uh, in thinking of, like, you know, with your own thoughts, leaving it to yourself. But also, you want to have some times where you're not just doing that. Or if you would have listened to something anyway, like I noticed some time before in the shower, I would have watched like NDA highlights or whatever, but then not actually see them because I'm showering and find it kind of useless. Um, I instead would listen to a podcast. And doing that kind of stuff makes it such that you're consuming information without making it so hard on you. Uh, again, don't confuse this with using this for time, you know, taking up time from uh, You don't want to make map loading feel like it's taking away stuff you enjoy. So if you're going to play a game, do that. Just play a game. If you're about to sleep, sleep don't make your eyes you know waste more of the precious like getting rid of the blue light that might keep you up for a longer period of time 
uh, again, this is about making it consistent and sustainable. It's difficult to do that if you are harming the other parts of your life that you find healthy and that you like. Um, you want to train your brain to associate matter loading to make things that are boring more fun, not to make things that are fun more boring. And I find that the stuff I mentioned here, even if you really enjoy it yourself, then feel free to come these into your hobbies. But I personally find them boring, partly because I don't really know how to cook. So I'm not cooking anything but anyway. Um, and I would rather use that time on something like matter loading because I feel it's more productive and that's more enjoyable. So you want to be able to train your brain and condition yourself in that manner. It gets easier over time. Uh, thirdly, assess yourself. Meaning, I really recommend taking quizzes. I love quizzes. Um, and the three publications I named here have weekly quizzes. So the New York Times, Slate, CNN. What they'll do is every week they will publish uh, a 10 point quiz about stuff. And it's helpful because it never takes 10 more minutes to answer, that the more than 10 minutes to answer. But one, if you can answer it and get a lot of things right, then it's rewarding. You feel like, yeah, yeah. I'm reading. I should continue to read. There's a sense of accomplishment when you can do well in these quizzes. But if you don't do well in these quizzes, um, and if anyone would want, you can feel free to take one now. If you don't do well, um, that's fine. I really like them when I don't do well, actually, because it's telling me these are the things you should be reading up more on. But sometimes there's stuff I would have never read about until I take one of these quizzes and think, okay, maybe I should have done that. All right. Uh, tip number four consume digestible content, meaning the hard case filing things I'm going to talk about later are, they, they take a lot more effort, more organization, more activity on your end. That's when you should consume the hard stuff, right? I'm not saying everything you should take in is easy. I'm saying you should know when to push yourself a bit and when to take things easy. So use videos that incorporate humor, editing, st editing styles that are maybe quicker, more cuts, etc. so that you know, we have very monkey brains. We have brains that are very difficult because of evolution to wire in a specific way. So sometimes just seeing things go fast on the screen, seeing a lot of colors, uh, you have no idea how big of an effect that can be. And doing and watching this kind of content can be very helpful. Uh, if you want to take a picture, these are all the YouTube channels I watch uh, for different things. I highly recommend all of them. Um, there are probably more. And and these categories are not like hard categories. I'd say the ones I watch the most, I really love TLDR news. They cover things very quickly and they're independent. They are a small media company from the UK. They cover global news, they cover UK news, they cover EU news, they cover US news. Those are the four channels actually, UK, US, EU, global. They're best with the UK stuff because that's where they're from. They make a few more mistakes when it comes to other regions of the world. But I do think that they provide very good, it's very fitting for debate, in fact, because sometimes they'll give a claim and then they'll provide three reasons why the claim is true. And that's pretty much what the debaters do, right? They say something and then they prove it with like three structured analysis, etc. TLDR News does that all the time. And I find they're very good because they, they're very fast when it comes to uploading, um, that kind of stuff. The other new sites I indicate here, I think they're the best when it comes to accessibility. Some are not as accessible, nor as valuable all the time. For example, Vice, I think not always valuable. And maybe the videos are a bit too long. Bloomberg, sometimes also a bit too long. But if you're into that, uh, go ahead. Politics and history, I, I think this is the main stuff you can really see on YouTube. Uh, a lot of these guys are funny. A lot of these guys really know how to tell a story. You guys like Johnny Harris are excellent at storytelling. So that really makes you engrossed. So it's not necessarily funny, but it's fun because it makes you feel invested in what's going on and what's happening. Kraut, I think, it is quite excellent at very, these are, these videos are quite long, admittedly, um, but they never feel like they're long. Uh, they're very fun to put on the background at times and just let them go. <laughs> Um, finance and econ. Uh, be very careful with finance and econ advice. I find a lot of people on YouTube that are trying to sell crypto um, might not be the best sources all the time because they hype up things based on how everyone else is hyping them up. Uh, they have an ulterior motive in mind, like letting you buy a product, letting you subscribe to a service. 
once they're trying to sell you something, be a bit hesitant. If they're selling you things that are like ads, that's a bit okay, pa. Um, but I think once they're trying to sell you a product or a seminar, they may be a bit more skeptical there. I really like these guys because they're very realistic. So for example, Two Cents explains, uh, it's very helpful for life also. Financial advice that an average person might want. How money works, I think, draws a very realistic view of the struggles people face today in the world. Patrick Boyle, in particular, I find an excellent resource because he's, uh, I think, a former investment banker. And any political issue, he will show you the economic and financial side. Other topics, so Legal Eagle talks about the law. Veritasium, I think, talks about very different things. Science, artificial intelligence, statistics, media, all that kind of stuff. Climate Town, I think, is quite good for the environment. School of Life, uh, I'm a bit more skeptical on, but I put it here because I think School of Life is very good for, you know, those narrative e debates, um, debates about uh, prefers a world where people believe something or prefers a world where maybe people pursued, for example, long-term relationships rather than short-term ones. I think School of Life, uh, not facts. I don't think you should take School of Life as factual, nor should you take it as life advice. I find that they make too many bold claims about the world for it to be believable. But I think in those softer motions where you are, you know, fighting for a particular side, there can be quite a good resource. Um, but note that there's always a trade-off. Sometimes the funnier it is, the more entertaining it is to watch. It's because it's starting to lack nuance or it's not addressing difficult or hard truths. Perhaps there's controversy it's avoiding. Perhaps it's trying to be funny to mask other stuff. So vary your sources because you want to get a lot of different sides in the story. You don't always have to believe the first things. All right, hard case pattern. This is the stuff that you require to exert more effort, um, but it'll have higher yields because you can have printed documents, you can use tournaments, you can obtain information fast, uh, better, and you just uh, have more information to work with. I think this is stuff you should be carving your schedule out for, not stuff that you should just like, how do I say this? Like. You can do it spontaneously, yeah. But I think it's best to have a specific day of the week that you are preparing to do this because it makes it easier to tolerate, I suppose, when you know your boundaries, you stop when you have to, etc. So tips for hard case filing. The first is be able to tell a story. A lot of the time, I encounter people that say they know a lot about the topic. But the moment you ask them about that topic, they don't know how to string their words together. And I don't think it's because they don't know about the topic. It's because you have so many separate pieces of facts and information that you don't know how to put them together. I'm um, sorry. If someone is unmuted, could you please mute? All right. So you have so many pieces of facts and information that you have no idea how to draw them together. And this, for me, is the litmus test of do you really understand the topic you're talking about? If someone had never read about the topic, has no idea what's going on, ask you what's going on, could you tell them in five minutes a story that would explain everything that's happened? Because if you think there are parts of your story that are missing, if you don't know where to begin, if you have a hard time being able to summarize everything in five minutes, that means perhaps you have to read a bit more. Fill in those gaps. As well as, sometimes you have to read and not just read, right? Not just know. Sometimes you have to be able to get everything you know and put it into something that you understand more. What I personally do is I have a Google Doc um, that is dedicated to a bunch of different countries, right? And for this country, I will explain its history. And I can't just get facts and then put it in the country. I have to rewrite, I have to rephrase, I have to string facts together. I have to make a story out of how did this nation come to be and where is it at now? Because if you can't do that, it makes it harder to use it in a debate. Because a lot of debating is just storytelling. You have to tell the judge what's going on. Because this is a judge that you have to assume doesn't know specifically about the topic. And given that, you can't show the judge an article and tell them these pieces of information make sense of it. You have to be the one to leave that narrative again. Um, so Practical advice for this, if you have family that is willing to tolerate you, friends that are curious about the topic, 
ask them if you can talk about it with them and explain what's going on. For example, my mother, she loves asking about the news and asking me what's going on. And I find it very good for me as well um, because it allows me to digest my thoughts and kind of mentally prepare how to explain it to another person. Second, you want to understand structures. I think that this is how you evolve towards more advanced analysis and data. So more than individual cases, it is better to understand how institutions, processes, and phenomena work. So let's say you have motions about the International Criminal Court. I think what a lot of people will do is look at the cases of the International Criminal Court rather than read documents from the International Criminal Court. What are they for? When are they used? What are the conditions for them to apply in a specific debate? When really, the latter is going to inform you about how to go about the debate more than the former. So, I think if you understand how something works, rather than just the particular things which it, in which it has done, it allows you an access to a lot more arguments. For the same reason that I'm sure you guys have heard the trend of structural reasons, being able to prove something is true, being able to you know, make sense of why an actor is likely to act a specific way, is all about understanding how these actors work. And that's, there's a second part to this, which is to understand theory. Um, more than facts, you want to understand what is the justification or what is the mindset for a lot of these people to do what they did or for these institutions to do what they did. So you want to understand frameworks, schools of thought, underlying philosophies beyond facts. I find this particularly useful in debates about feminism because in feminist debates, um, you can argue a bunch of different things. It's never going to tell you what's more important than the other. I think what unlocked a lot of feminism debates for me was first reading about the second and third wave of feminism, um, where the central question was, how do we treat a woman's agency? Where a second wave feminism might say, a lot of women are conditioned to believe patriarchal norms and have internalized them. We should try to abolish all these patriarchal norms and the patriarchy. Um, and, and as a consequence, it would be, it, one, women's choices can be born out of patriarchal conditioning. And two, that these choices that they make can potentially harm other women. So for example, a debate about prostitution on banning prostitution on drugs, a lot of people will say, a lot of the people who opt into prostitution do so out of desperation. Uh, a lot of women who might be poorer, a lot of women who might be lesser privileged and have no other alternatives opt into this. Third wave feminism, will instead say that women should not be seen as objects that just internalize everything the patriarchy tells them. That there's a sufficient amount of agency that women should be believed and you know, assumed to have as people and you know, being able to respect their intellectual capacities such that the choices they make aren't just conditioned and forced into them. They're not results of coercion, but they have, like, to some extent, freely made these choices and that they have owned up to them and fully understand the consequences of them. So an emotion, again, about banning prostitution, that's the op case. That maybe part of it is their social economic condition, but that's the same reason anyone would get any job, right? So what makes prostitution different from any other job people might do out of their social economic conditions? And in that case, you have to trust that women know the kind of work they're opting into when they opt for sex work, and therefore that decision should be respected. It shouldn't be seen as just patriarchal, uh, you know, patriarchally conditioned, but people who have their own agencies and freedoms. So those kinds of philosophies, I think, really lead into the kinds of cases and arguments you're able to make. So they allow you to apply theory to a number of debates rather than specific like parts of it. They allow you to draw principles, justify things, why things are. And like, for many different debates, sometimes you just need an additional lens to look at things with. So can we view this debate from an economic angle and whose theory should be used? Is there a feminist perspective to this debate? Doing all of these things and understanding the theory behind them also informs how you look at motions and how you prepare for them. There is divide and conquer, which is, as I said a while ago, a lot of debates are very complex, quite overwhelming. So what you want to do is divide them into different aspects and just keep dividing and dividing and dividing until you reach something that you think is more understandable is more in your wheelhouse. For example, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
very, very long story. It is not a development that is only a week in the making. It is a development that is decades in the making, if not centuries. And being able to understand that helps you understand why things are going on today. But it's helpful to, you know, you, you can't know all the specific parts immediately. It helps to know all the smaller parts. So maybe we should look at the leaders first. You have Putin and Zelensky, uh, Russia, Ukraine. And then you might want to see what are the reasons Putin is saying that he is invading Ukraine? And there are so many. Uh, a lot of them, obviously, not generous, not genuine, rather, not ones that should be actually believed. So saying that we are one country, Ukraine has always been a part of Russia, we should bring it back. Saying that Ukraine is filled with leaders that are communists, that are ruining the country, not true. Um, saying that Ukraine has neo-Nazis in its force and you have to denazify and clean up Ukraine. Obviously not true. But all of these things are things Putin is using and using the media to manipulate, or manipulating the media rather, to convince the Russian populace as to why you should, like, you know, why he would end up doing this. So all of these things only happen once you look at every aspect and divide it into smaller, more digestible parts. And once you've read all these different things, you look back and think, wow, I actually understand the whole a lot better. And in tandem with being able to tell a story, um, this is a very useful strategy because it also makes it feel less overwhelming once you're taking it on bit by bit. You're never going to understand something by just looking at some long summary and then thinking, I get it now. It's a bunch of different things that once you finally put it together, it makes so much sense. Uh, lastly, work with others. And here are some possible ideas for collaboration. So one is you can divide topics amongst yourselves and take notes on a Google Doc. So what I would normally do with my partners is we would have regions of the world that you were all specifically assigned to. And for those regions of the world, you have to read up on them. You have to know the context of all those countries. So for example, person A, you're in charge of uh, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe, right? Person B, you're in charge of Northeast Asia, um, Central Asia, and South America. Um, and then obviously there are smaller divisions there that you have to make, but it makes math loading seem less overwhelming. And the more people you can divide us among, the better it is. So let's say you have a short assignment. Maybe share one article every week about your region in a group chat or in a Facebook group. Um, and then you'll find out over time, you're just collecting more and more information. You find out more about these countries. Um, second, one thing we used to do in our debate society was we would spend a day just for lectures. And we would divide lecture topics among different people. And that was helpful because I learned about so many different topics, but I only had to research about one. So we'd have maybe like nine to 10 lectures a day that were never really long. They were like 15 minutes or so. And then being able to put all of that together. Suddenly, you have so much information without all the effort of having to personally research and find out all of that information. Um, I just got asked the question, how can I organize my ideas in the Google Doc? Um, that's part of the uh, challenge, right? You have to categorize. You have to be the one to find the different aspects. Because like I said here, you should be able to tell the story. If you are able to look at different aspects, maybe create a timeline of events, and really appeal to your own way of learning. I'm a very auditory learner, meaning I like hearing things. Things I hear, I don't forget as much as the things I see, which I'm more likely to forget. Um, but if you're a visual learner, for example, it might help to do something like this. Maybe you want to create a little map of all the topics, right? So that when you're in a debate round and you're trying to close your eyes and remember the map, it all makes sense again. So organizing is part of the challenge because it allows you to, you know, cater to your own strengths and then build them. Uh, recommended sources. I really like long form YouTube videos. I really enjoy, um, to be fair, I'm a bit more skeptical of his videos on the conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan. 
but I really enjoyed Caspian Report. Um, Johnny Harris, like I mentioned earlier, has a lot of really good long form videos. New Africa um, has a lot of really good videos about Africa. And a lot of them are very informative. They're about 40 minutes to an hour. Uh, but honestly, if you're curious about a topic, there are so many free documentaries on YouTube. Um, and obviously vet them as much as possible, make sure they're not you know, fake news or anything like that. Um, but YouTube is honestly a really great place. There's so much free information. Academic journals are very good. Um, and if you're curious about what academic journals to pursue, what I would recommend, recommend is um, maybe just Googling the topic and then journal, but don't read the first thing you see. Look at citations and look at what the most commonly cited journals are. And thus that builds credibility and you can understand that. Um, lectures, I, I love lectures. Uh, I really, really like lectures um, because again, I'm an auditory learner. And what I like about lectures is that it's helpful for debates because lectures are about speaking. So wording things, organizing information, giving reasons for something to be true, all part and parcel of lectures. A lecture series I highly recommend um, well, look at Yale courses. Yale University has a bunch of free lectures online. Honestly, you could learn an entire like, major at that point with how much free content they have. But I really enjoy Power in Politics in Today's World with Professor Ian Shapiro. I think that's one of the most informative lectures you could possibly watch. And uh, I haven't finished it. I'd say I'm about 15 lectures, 20 lectures in. Um, but once you finish that lecture series, I think you will just have a much better understanding of the world than you did than you than you did before watching that series. Because that's how I personally feel um, after having watching that whole series. Okay, um, so for this section, I can take questions now, and then we can move on to how to use matter in debates. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Michael, sorry to interrupt. Uh, since in the beginning I said earlier that we're going to be a participant documentation and we accidentally forgot about it, is it all right we do it now for a participant documentation right now before we do Q and A? Yeah, no worries. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so everyone uh, in this room, uh, please uh, turn on your camera if you don't have any connection issue because we would like to do a participant documentation. Uh, maybe Fallon or other organizing committee that uh, responsible for uh, taking a pictures. Uh, sure. Wait a second. Um, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. For everyone, uh, we would like to ask you to op open your camera for the documentation purpose. Okay, I see some of uh, the vast majority of people of their comments. That's why I'm encouraging all of you to. Um, it's just gonna take a second. Not gonna take a long time. All right, cool. So we're gonna start. Documentation session. We have five slides here. That's why so I'm gonna start from the first slide. I'm gonna start three, two, one. All right, thank you for the first slide. Now we're gonna move to the second slide. I see some of you still turn off your camera. I will encourage if you don't have any significant uh, any trouble to turn on your all right, that's cool. Thank you. I'm gonna start to take a picture of the second slide in three, two, one. Cool. The third slide. I'm gonna start to take it in three, two, one. Moving to the fourth slide. I'm gonna take it in three, two, one. Okay, to the last slide. I'm gonna start to take a picture in three, two, one. All right, that's for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, 
Kalian for the um, documentation, so I would like to, uh, if you guys have any question, you could uh, fill the form that already shared. Now I would like to level within the materials. And uh, the first question uh, coming from Joy Pamnami, the question is, news is often biased. Do you have any advice for debaters to consume information more objectively? Also, any recommendation or source if you are a beginner of, for the topic? Um, so I think if you want to purely avoid bias, the best source is uh, BBC because they have rules in how they publish and decide what stories to cover that explicitly remove bias. They want to ensure no political agenda. They want to ensure that they don't, um, they're not influenced and they don't have their information, or rather the information um, lean towards one particular side or another. So if you're really looking for just objective information, that's what you want to look at. Um, but what I will say in tandem with this is that bias is not always bad. Um, that said, I think bias that is unreasonable, bias that targets specific groups of people, bias that is malicious and harmful, and bias that is a conflict of interest. So for example, if you have news that is being published by someone who would benefit that news. Um, if I'm not mistaken, for example, some of the studies that have been done on uh, American breakfast foods and that they're healthy and nutritious was commissioned by cereal companies because they would benefit off of people thinking that cereal was healthy and nutritious. That is bad bias. All of these things you want to vet, you want to make sure you know, um, you're not reading those kinds of sources. But I think bias is not always bad in the sense that one, you can't make arguments without bias, because arguments always presume you are leading towards one more side than the other. So opinion articles only come from some biased sources, yes, but you still want to be able to vary your news sites. You want to ensure you are reading both sides, especially the side that you are not comfortable with, the side that you might disagree with. Because, well, one, for debating, it's a bit harder to make arguments if it's a motion that you don't personally support. So knowing what the other side is going to say is very helpful in the case you're put on that other side. But two is you want to check your own biases. Um, if it's something you don't believe, but if you can't rebut it, you know, that makes, it just kind of tells you that what you do believe is something that perhaps, um, what do you call this? You believe it for the wrong reasons, right? If you believe something, but the responses to your beliefs can't be rebutted. You have no ways in which you can respond to people proving you wrong. That might mean that you should read the other side a bit more or ways that will rebut that argument. So bias in itself, not inherently wrong. You just want to check against bad biases as well as vary your sources. That's all for this question. Okay, uh, very well, thank you. So. Uh, if you want bias, uh, there's a more objective news source there like BBC, but somehow bias is good because like somehow you are debating on the other side that you might be uncomfortable with. So yeah, the next question coming from Jephtha. Uh, oh, no. um, yeah, so I, I think... Our moderator might have just disconnected for a bit. Let's just wait until they get back. Uh, check. Yep, I can hear you. Uh, this is my backup device. Uh, okay. Um, the next question is from Tifta. The question is, where do you put your matter into the argument? Like if you put in context, where do you put it in the context of the argument? Or if you put it in actor analysis, where do you put it in the actor analysis? Okay, um, so we're gonna cover that a bit more in the coming section of the lecture. But 
I think my answer to this is there's no hard rule. You want to be adaptable. So you want to look at why are you saying the matter you're sharing to begin with? If this matter is important for understanding the rest of the argument, put it at the start. If this matter is just a further explanation or trying to illustrate an argument you're making, put it at the end, right? So ask yourself, do you need the matter to prove the logic? If yes, matter first. If it helps the logic and it's a guide for the logic, logic first. Because you want to avoid the trap of arguing by example or judges thinking that you're just using an example and that's your whole argument. That would not make for a compelling argument. Um, make sure the logic comes first, unless the logic needs the matter. So for example, in an international relations motion, you can't just use pure logic, right? You would have to explain what the context of a country is, what's going on, what are the facts, and then use logic after. But let's say it's an argument you've already made and you just want to use a good example of how your argument works. That's when you put the example. That's all for this question. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. So that's how you uh, put it in the arguments. And the next question uh, uh, coming from Hamza Stan. The question is that for competition prep purpose, what's the time frame you suggest for people to up the frequency of their matter building? Uh, so that's a good question. I think this is definitely up to your schedules and how free you could possibly be. Um, but what I would say is if I know a tournament is coming soon, I would do... Uh, sorry, I'm just thinking about it. I'd say I would do at least... So let's say the tournament is a month from now. And I'm already in prep mode, right? I'm trying to ready myself. I will do two, maybe three hours a week of hard case filing. And then perhaps an hour, no, not an hour, perhaps two to three hours a day of easy case filing. Um, and there are no hard set rules. Again, you want to make it sustainable. A month is still a long amount of time. You can burn out before that period of time. But I'd say that's how I go about it. And really, it sounds like a lot, but you really don't notice the time go by. Like for example, when I am making my meals, I don't realize that I've already watched what is the equivalent of a documentary by the time I've made my meal and finished eating my meal. Um, yeah, that's all for that question. Uh, okay, thank you. So, like, uh, really sweeting with you, like, and so on, right? It's like, now moving on to the next question coming from name Confuse. Uh, the question is theories are important, but theories are a lot. Are there any suggestion of on what theories the better should focus on? That's a good question. Um, honestly. What I would recommend is to look at school curricula. <laughs> that, that's a little bit weird, but I really think so. So if you think about a school, right, you want to teach a lot of subject matter in a semester of about six months. You're not going to teach all of the subject matter, right? Um, and I'm not saying go through the course, right? I don't want to give you guys a whole other university to go to called Debate University. But what I will say is that if you can find the subject matter online, and don't look at anything too complex, right? Look at the 101s, look at the, the basics, whatever the first subject of the course is. And then look at how the course is structured. So they'll probably only pick the most important theories you have to know um, for that course. So uh, honestly, a, a really helpful tool you guys could use is Khan Academy. And you don't even have to go through the Khan Academy courses, right? You can just look at how the Khan Academy courses are structured. Um, and Khan Academy, like, I, I think most people associate it with, like, math. They have a really good economics series, economics and finance. 
highly recommend that if you want to see that. Uh, yeah, that's all for this question. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, uh, next question uh, coming from name X. The question is, why is understanding a country history important? Uh, so that's a good question. And I used to think that that wouldn't be so important as well. Um, that said, like I find it important, but it like it's discounted given how long ago it was. Meaning I think the most recent information is more useful still, right? For any country, you wouldn't need to know what happened 800 years ago for you to understand what's going on today. But I think history gives a lot of, um, I guess, information as to why country works that way and is structured that way. So for example, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, a lot of it is about history, right? One of Putin's justifications for the ongoing invasion of Ukraine is that it was a former Soviet state and that because of his appeals to Russian nationalism, he wants to say that it is still a part of Russia and the Soviet Union. And because of that, he thinks it's justified. So drawing up that kind of nationalism um, gives a lot of ideas as to why that works today. And even recent history, so knowing that Russia tried to annex Crimea in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, 2014, um, is very helpful in understanding why they're trying to do the same further in the Ukraine today. And doing that, I think it, it gives a lot of insight as to why things are going on the way they are. Because world leaders are also operating on history and knowing that they're using past actions as the basis for the next actions. So for example, and this is my personal view, you could think that I'm wrong, but, oh, sorry, I think someone's unmuted. Anyway, um, I think when Russia annexed Georgia in 2008 and Crimea in the mid 2010s, it went largely unpunished. It did not have the same force of Western sanctions that it did today. There were sanctions for sure. They're just not as strong as they are today because the ones today are quite, quite intense. Um, and I think part of the reason Russia was willing to invade Ukraine was because they thought they wouldn't get punished for it. They thought the West, too scared to act, will not do anything, will get away with it again. And I think they're slowly realizing that might have been a mistake, that the West called their bluff, that they're not actually able to conduct a full-scale war. And you'll notice there's a lot of proof Russia is not prepared for war. There are Russian soldiers who are asking for directions as to how to get to Kiev. There are tanks that have been towed by Ukrainian farmers. Um, using that kind of history, because leaders are also using that history to see what's going to happen if I do this or that, um, I think gives a lot of insight. That's all for this question. Okay, thank you. So history somehow used as a pattern for the next scene. So this is a last question for the uh, this first section. The name is Fiat. No, no Fiat. Uh, the question is, hi, I feel like watching matter on something tangible like IR or history helps with content consume over time. However, when it's something abstract and complex like economics, I still struggle and feel not like making much progress, even with matter loading. What should I do? Okay. Um, when that happens, I think what that means is that you are consuming information that is overwhelming. So what I'd recommend is consuming things that are, I guess, easier to some point, and then working towards things that are hard. And I'm not saying it's because you can't do it. What I'm saying is that you may need more positive reinforcement. So if you watch a top a video on something that maybe you know mostly about, like 70, 80% about, you watch it, and then you think, great, I understood this. It's a lot more encouraging and motivating to move on to bigger and harder topics at that point. So not because I don't think you, I think that you don't understand enough, 
is that I think more positive reinforcement is needed. So work from small to big. When I was in high school, I was trying to understand the 2008 financial crisis. And for the life of me, I could not understand what it, how it worked, what happened, what occurred. Um, but like I said earlier, divide and conquer, work bit by bit. So I first went to trying to understand what a mortgage was. Because I realized I didn't know what a mortgage was, right? I was trying to understand mortgage-backed securities. Uh, I was trying to understand the whole collapse of financial system. But I didn't know what a mortgage was. I was like early high school at this time. So I thought, let's start here. And then I understood that. And then I tried to understand ratings agencies. And then I understood them. I tried to understand um, bubbles, how bubbles work. And then once I got that done, I slowly worked my way up towards watching lectures about the 2008 financial crisis. And once the person was naming a bunch of different things that I was like, oh, I understand how that works. And now I know how that and another thing that I understand works interact. And they're drawing connections for me. So really, you have to work your way there. Um, try to go from the basics, not just because it helps, but because it's more encouraging and motivating. It makes you feel like what you're trying to understand isn't really as complex as you thought it was. That, that's all for this question. OK, uh, thank you. Hopefully, it helped you to not like no longer struggle. Now, uh, this is the last question for this section. Uh, I give it back to Miko to continue your second section. Okay, uh, so for this second section, we're going to talk about how to use matter. I'm going to do some things that like, like what the purpose of matter is, as well as things you should be avoiding when trying to use matter in the context. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes, it's visible. All right, great. So how do you use matter? Um, let's first ask, what should you not do with matter? Matter isn't for showing off or name dropping. You don't want to just look like you're the smartest person in the round, naming like a bunch of countries and saying, look, I know this stuff. If you're not using matter with a particular purpose in mind, i.e. you don't have a goal with the matter you're using, it could end up confusing people. It might make people feel like they're not understanding what you're trying to say. Um, and I'll explain later, there are actually negative consequences of bringing things up that you don't use. So why do you use mapping? I think there are three main ways. The first is you want to do it illustrate. Because some concepts are difficult to understand in theory, but once you have a few good examples, the judge is like, ah, okay, I know completely what they understand, what they mean. And see, sometimes you and the judge are hearing the same words that are leaving your mouth. But what the judge is picturing in their heads is different from what you're picturing in your head, especially because you had 15 or 30 minutes to prepare your case. The judge is hearing it for the first time. So the words you're using can be very particular in the sense that maybe you talked about it with your teammates, you fully understand what's going on, you have an image in your head. The judge doesn't have that same thing. They don't have the benefit of the amount of time it takes for an argument to simmer in their heads. And so examples, I think, are very helpful in saying, here's the picture I'm trying to paint. I want this in your head so we're on the same page. That's essentially what you're saying when you're trying to use matter through an example. So for example, you once made an argument that art made by the wealthy, even if it is about the struggles of the poor, because the debate was about um, something, of, yeah, I think it was about um, art created by the wealthy. I'm forgetting the specific motion. But essentially, I think the argument from the other side was saying the rich have an incentive to make art about the poor. And what we were saying is that even if that's true, it's patronizing. It doesn't reflect their true experiences. Um, here's where the matter comes in. In that debate, I used the example of a Filipino artist. I think it was a debate that occurred in the Philippines. So for those who don't know, I'm Filipino. Um, and this is an artwork by Fernando Amorsolo, who is, by all accounts, an elite artist in the Philippines. Someone who was quite well off, trained very um, through institutions, all that kind of stuff. And what he is depicting here um, are Filipino farmers. Now, we used Amorsolo as an example in the case where we said most of Amorsolo's work depicts the struggles, not the struggles, the experiences of the Filipino farmer 
and people from rural Filipino communities. But even when he does that, the work that he does makes the work look easy. Look how calm they look, right? Look how easy life, like and good life looks. It makes it look clean. Look at them. There's not a smidge of dirt on them, even when agriculture and farming it is very dirty work. And it looks very chill, right? They're sitting around, they're talking, they're sharing their baskets, etc. And here, it's very patronizing because it makes it seem like this is work that is easy. It makes it seem like they live good lives without struggle. And that's not to say that these are people who don't live lives that are meaningful, but that is to say that a lot of the artwork about them, when done from the lens of the rich, erases a lot of their struggles. There are so many struggles that the Filipino farmer today faces. Uh, they're severely underpaid. Uh, they don't, they make way below minimum wage. And minimum wage in the Philippines is not enough for you to be able to provide your basic necessities. But that's not something you would understand from this picture. It looks like they're all happy and they're just, you know, picking mangoes together. It looks like a great time. But really, that's not the case. And this is the kind of example that when you can illustrate it to a judge, so say something like Fernando Marsolo depicted the struggle, uh, the experiences of the Filipino rural farmer. But in these paintings, made farming look easy, made farming look pristine, and made farming look like it was the best thing that anyone could ever do, rather than depict the incredibly difficult realities that the Filipino farmer faces. And that erases their struggles and makes it difficult for them to lobby for change. These are things that aren't done by the wealthy. So one example to fully illustrate the point we're making about the patronizing art of the rich. Second is it increases believability. So sometimes a claim you make in a debate is hard to believe. Not because it's not true, right? Don't use matter, to, you know, don't use fake matter, right? Don't lie. Uh, that's the last thing you want. But some things go against. Maybe the judge has different personal experiences from you, and therefore they might not believe you so much. Or it's just a fact that's unintuitive. A good example of that is, I'm not sure if this is, yeah, like perhaps to me it was unintuitive. But when I was first learning about and reading about transport, when you expand highways, you make highways wider, there's a good chance traffic stays the same or is even higher. And that's because at first you might decongest the lanes because there's more space. But once the lanes get decongested, more people are going to take cars. And once that happens, because they're taking cars, you increase traffic and it offset the initial gains of space that the highway might have made. That's not something that maybe all people believe or all people know. And you might want to give an example of that. I think in Houston, they tried to do that with the highway. And America now actually is trying to dis like, demolish a, a bunch of different highways through, throughout the country. Um, one argument we were making, uh, it was a debate about pedophilia. And what we were saying was that the, the, one of the struggles the LGBTQ community faces is that a lot of people associate pedophilia with the LGBTQ community as a way to weaponize it against the LGBTQ community. Now, obviously, that is wrong. That is terrible. Um, but it also, I think we're arguing, was one of the reasons we shouldn't be more accepting towards pedophiles, because I think the motion is about pedophile rights, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the example we used was Victor Orban in Hungary. So what he did was he made a bunch of anti-LGBT laws and mixed them in with anti-pedophilia laws so that he would get popular support for them. So it didn't look like an anti-LGBT move. It looked like an anti-pedophilia move. And thus, he was able to get away with it. But really, this is obviously an unfair, untrue bundling of different people that should not be supported. Thirdly, you want to use it to build contexts. Um, because it, as I said earlier, sometimes you build a context in order for an argument to be true after. And you want to situate a debate. Um, especially when these contexts are important for proving the truth of one thing or another. So I once had a round where I believe the, one of the main questions about the debate was, should you choose to become a police officer when you are from a minority community, if I'm not mistaken? And we were on the side that says it would be to your benefit to become a police officer. Obviously not my personal views, something we had to argue in the context of the motion. Um, but 
we had matter that allowed us to have more specificity and prove a claim to a great life. So on up, what they were saying was that it is against your benefit as a minority individual to become a police officer because minority communities hate the police and thus they will find that you betray them. But one of their examples was the Delta's war on drugs. There was a highly controversial policy in the Philippines and they're saying people hate them. I'm from the Philippines, right? So we had the map there to show that. In, in fact, the Delta war on drugs, I, I personally am very much so against it and do not support it in any manner. But it's very popular among Filipinos. It's one of the reasons the Delta got elected. And if you look at what people think the biggest problems in the Philippines are today, they will say illegal or illicit drugs are a huge problem that the Philippines is facing. So what we said was because of this context, it's actually not likely the community is going to turn against you because a lot of them support it. A lot of them hate drug addicts. A lot of them hate crime. And a lot of them feel like you would be restoring order to their communities. Next slide, please. Uh, wait, I realize I'm doing it. Um, here are some things to avoid when using math theory arguments. The first is you want to avoid arguing by example. So you don't want to use an example to prove the argument. And that's why I said logic has to complement the example. And you have to assess whether or not the matter is needed for the logic or if it simply illustrates the logic. Um, because if you just have examples, it, it's very easy for the other side to say, this is one case, it's an isolated incident, or it's not the majority of cases. So what you want to do is explain why the matter that you have has common characteristics with other cases, other countries maybe, other pieces of information, etc., such that it's not an isolated case. This is just a way for you to illustrate the more general thing that's going on. It is not overly specific. So you want to make sure that there's logic that is backing. And then when you're explaining the matter, you're looking at that underlying trend, the underlying common characteristics, rather than just giving an example. Second, do not show it in drama. Meaning there are so many times where I see debaters show a very good piece of information. I'm like, wow, they know that. That's great. That could win them the round. And then they drop it. Because one, they kind of assume the judge might know it already. Or two, they don't fully flesh it out to the extent in which it would have been strategic. So don't simply name cases or state events. You have to assume that the judge is the average reasonable person. So they don't know anything beyond what is the front page of the news. And therefore, being able to illustrate something can be very useful. If you think it is important to the case, take the time to explain how it happened, why it happened, why is that important, why is it analogous to what's going on today. Third, uh, I think this is something that's very important. Don't do example tennis, which is go will give three examples for Gov side. Op will give three examples for the other side. What you're telling the judge is, here's a bunch of stuff, you decide. You don't want to do that, right? So for example, um, let's say the US trade war in China, you were debating this in like 2020, 2019 or something. Gov could give three reasons the US is winning the trade war. Op could give three reasons China is winning the trade war, right? And then at that point, the judge is just, you know, confused. It's back and forth. It's even. Um, and that isn't to say that you shouldn't give these reasons. But it is to say that you want to resolve these different deadlocks. So when you give examples and facts, don't just say that they are true. You want to say that they matter more. So why does this apply in more cases? What is more likely to occur? So let's say... You were trying to prove that the Trump administration was becoming more isolationist. So you say stuff like the Trump administration withdrew from Syria, they withdrew from Afghanistan, all that kind of stuff, and therefore they're isolationist. And then the op material says, no, he killed Soleimani, he used the WTO against India, Iran, a bunch of other countries. 
So he's not just withdrawing everywhere. He's becoming more active in different places. And once these two pieces of contradicting information are shown to me as a judge, I wouldn't know what to do with them because they seem even. So let's say you would go, and you're trying to prove they're more isolationist. Maybe you could say something like, they are being more isolationist militarily. They are less willing to commit troops on the ground. And maybe for some reason, the military is the most important aspect of the debate, even if not economically. Or you could say something like, look at who Trump appeals to. These are people who think America should go first, people who want to make America great again, and therefore, America should abandon its commitments everywhere throughout the world. So while he might not fully abandon everywhere, it is the increasing trend with Trump and something that he pretty much takes platform on. So explaining why your cases are the majority, but they're more likely, or the more important, beyond just throwing examples and you know, saying, other side, give another example so we can finish this debate. That's not going to be a winning strategy. Um, this is the last slide of the lecture. Um, sorry, the next one is going to be the last slide of the lecture. So I just want to flag, let's see how long we take to take questions, and then maybe we'll have some time for a bit of a case book. Um, number four, avoid saying everything you know. There are times when, like I said earlier, it's effort to read, right? So when you know stuff about a country or a Moshe, you want to reveal everything you know. You want to make sure that everything comes out. You want to protect against that innate desire of yours to show your expertise on the topic. Ask yourself, is this information you need for the argument? Do you, does it help the argument? Is it adding to the argument? Because if not, the downside of that is not just that you're using up time, but that you are giving arguments to the other side. I was once in a break round of, I think, Yale IV, where I was closing opposition. Uh, my opening opposition is from the country where the motion was sent. I knew about the country, but I definitely did not know as much as my opening opposition. <laughs> but my opening opposition gave out so many facts, so many pieces of information that I don't think they always concluded. A lot of them were underbaked, a lot of them were not used, a lot of them felt like sharing, right? So what I did at closing opposition was I took down all of these things. And then I used them to make my own argument. I concluded all the information they were giving out. This is matter that I personally did not read or encounter and had not heard until their speeches. So they were helping me by giving out this information because they weren't concluding or finishing the argument with a lot of this information. So you have to ask yourself, can I make an argument out of this? Can I conclude it? Can I compellingly use it to persuade a judge? Otherwise, you might be giving a card to your opponents. And when you do that, that is very, very much so not to your strategic advantage in a debate that you're taking part in. So to conclude this section, I suppose, matter is not just information that you want to share out in the debate. It is information of particular strategic importance. And you want to make sure you're asking yourself, why am I sharing this matter? What is it doing to the argument? How is it making it better? If you don't know the answer to that question, either you have to find a way to display the matter better, or you should drop the matter in favor of something that might be more compelling or more advantageous. I've also seen rounds where people know so much about the motion that they end up losing because they share so much context that isn't argumentative. Information is not argumentative, right? Just because you share a fact doesn't mean that it helps your side. It's just a fact. You have to frame that information in a way that is going to be beneficial to your side. If you fail to do that, then it's not information you should be sharing. Um, that's all. Yeah, that should be all for this section of the lecture. Um, I'm going to take questions now, and then let's see if we can have the demo still. Uh, otherwise, maybe we can just have an extended question. question. <laughs> Uh, I think if you want to like do demo first, demonstration first, uh, and then after that like Q and A, it's okay. I think I prefer to do the Q and A while we're studying. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, 
on the stream one. Okay, sorry, I'm muted. Okay, so the there are this is an interesting question coming from name Jeff. The question is, hello Miko, I hope my question makes sense. How do we matter load in a way that we can hope that we can use such information as a case or an argument in future motion? Because there can be this tendency that you do matter load a lot, but it's still likely that you won't find them to be usable. Also, we noticed that at score do introduce a lot of unconventional concept to be debated about, such as on folk saints or maternal ambivalence, and what we do so that we can at least encounter by tense some of this non-mainstream concept. Thank you. Right. That's a very good question. For the first part of that question, I think what you should do is when you're matter loading, make motions. Put yourself in the position of an edge board. How can you make a motion out of the article or the topic you're reading about? Once you do that, you have to ask yourself, what's the guff case for that motion? What's the op case for that motion? Uh, when you do this, honestly, you'll realize you encounter motions that you have made before. It happens to me in some tournaments where I read up on something and I think, what could they possibly say about this topic? And then they do set it the next meeting. That's not coincidence. That's not prediction power. It's that you are probably reading up on the same news as is reading. And so you made a motion, they made a motion, and it turns out that it was probably the most reasonable motion to make in that way. So don't just matter load and consume information. I really like this question, actually. Make motions out of the information you're consuming. Um, that's something I feel like I've gained the knack for because sometimes some of my uh, org mates message me and ask me, what motions do you think they might set in the next turn? I didn't do the Asian majors this year for UADC and ABP. Um, but so, some of the uh, uh, people from Ateneo who were doing the majors asked me, what do you think they'll set in this uh, major? And I'm like, well, I think there's this issue right now. There are a few motions you could make about it. This one, this one, and this one. And then some of the motions ended up coming up. Um, so really, make motions out of the map that you read in order to, I don't know, uh, by chance, at some points, encounter them. Definitely, you won't be hitting all the motions you make, but you will hit some, and that's what matters the most. Second, for more on conventional topics, I think that's hard in the sense that, I don't know, I just don't think you'll be able to predict that. Um, and so what you'd want to be able to do is not to look at all of the niche things in the world, right? You will spend so much time on looking at every single individual topic. But what you can do is understand, have a general understanding of many different things. So perhaps you don't know about a specific motion in question, but you know enough about philosophy, you know enough about economics or finance or Say it's a motion about China. It's a very specific motion about China. You might not know about that specific motion. You know how the Chinese local government works. You know about China's international relations. You know about China's economic structure. All of those will help you, right? So generalities help the specifics, and specifics help the generalities. And in the instances that we can't look at every single niche topic, the generalities might be there. That's all for that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, next question from Daryl Tan Yi Chin. Uh, I think this question kind of related with the previous section. The question is, may I know should I prioritize making case files or prioritize prepping motion? Could you please tell me how much time you allocate for both of them? Uh, in all honesty, I don't case build very much. Um, but it's not that I don't believe in case build. I think it is about playing to your strengths. So ever since I was, uh, what do you call this, like in debate, I found that my personal strength is that I'm a very substantive speaker. I like making arguments more than rebuttals. I like making cases. And so I've built a bit of a knack for that. Um, I know how to organize information. I know the parts of an argument very well. I know how an argument should flow. Um, and that's not because, you know, I just knew it. It's because of the part of my career early on. That's the part I like the most. 
So that's the part I spent a lot of time on. That's the part I spent, like, that's the part I trained. That's, I, I would case spell a lot earlier on in my career. Um, but at this point, I feel like that's not where I can make the biggest difference. The biggest difference is I feel like I should know more about the world. So I spend a lot more time reading new information than case building. What's the conclusion of this? Ask yourself, what is the biggest improvement you can make in debating right now? If you feel that your fundamentals could use a bit of work, if you feel that you would want to be able to fix how you organize your thoughts and ideas in your head, focus on case building. Because case building, I think, is very helpful for that. It makes you used to the exercise. Some things just become second nature at that point, especially um, if you don't have a constant partner. So, or you're trying to build chemistry with an input. Um, knowing how each other's break works, what the flow of prep time is going to be, how you guys work with each other, that all comes with building cases. But for me personally, I think there's not enough knowledge that I have about the world uh, just yet to feel confident in every motion. So that's where I think I have to improve now. Um, and that's why I'm spending a lot more time doing that than case building. Because I think with case building, the the flaw of case building is you're not consuming new information. You're just reorganizing things you know. So it's a more of an exercise in recall in your head. It's more of an exercise of how do you organize your thoughts rather than how do you learn, right? And I think I have to learn. So that's why I spent more time. So I think that's how you should allocate that. Okay, uh, thank you. The next question is from name their case type of natural causes. The question is, should judges also be working on matter building? As I noticed that the trend is debaters, especially in competitive international events, are getting more creative and elaborate with their arguments compared uh, to a few years ago. Um, I appreciate the name. <laughs> I didn't think that would get much uh, airtime. But, um, Huh, that's a good question. That's a very good question, in fact. I think the hard part about it is that you don't want to use that information as a judge, right? Because if you're using information that you know rather than information the debaters give you, that might be stepping in, intervening more in the debate. But at the same time, I don't want to say to be a good judge, you should know nothing, right? Because that's a bit unfair. Um, I think judges should be matter loading, yes. I feel like the average reasonable person, we all have very different conceptions of who the average reasonable person is. But I think there are times when there's information that the debater is giving that makes a lot of sense, is very easy to understand, um, and it's very straightforward. It doesn't require specialized knowledge or they, it does, but then the debater is giving that specialized knowledge such that you might personally have, you know, it's reasonable to expect you as a judge to believe it, to understand it. Um, but sometimes it just gets in the way, right? Sometimes you don't know all the words being put together, what they mean. Or you're encountering information that is so new to you that you're apprehensive towards believing it or you might just have difficulty processing and comprehending. And so knowing about the world, but not applying it in the debate, right? Giving the debater still the responsibility of knowing, or giving you that information. But at the same time, because it's familiar to you, because it's not entirely you, you don't have to spend too much time in your own head processing or comprehending what they're sharing. I feel like math loading does help judges quite, quite a lot. Okay, uh, thank you for answering that. Uh, and I think this is last question because uh, maybe there's still a demonstration after this. A uh, question from name David Africa's FL Twin, Goliath Asia. The question is, as debaters, should you always flag down false matter? I'm afraid it's just wasting time and making the debate more confusing. How do educators know if the matter is true or false? That is a very good question. And a question that I think is a challenge for debating overall, right? 
because you could read all you want and then suddenly your opponent says something that's just patently false. And then suddenly it's like you guys read the same amount, even though what you're saying is true, they're saying it's false. But a judge who is supposed to be an average reasonable person has to give equal credence to both. And you're just like, man, what do you do about that? Um, so what do you do with false matter? One, do, it's annoying. I will admit it's annoying. It's something that gets on my nerves. But if it is false matter, do not play the same game of, no, you, we're the one that's lying. And then they'll say, no, you're lying. And then nothing is resolved, right? Like I said here, beyond just example tennis, there's matter tennis. So you're lying. No, you're lying. And then it's hard to understand. You have to give logical reasons why a certain piece of information is false. And hopefully, like, you know, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have to do that. But you have to explain here reasons why this had never happened and why this is highly unlikely and they didn't do it. This matter is false. I don't think it's a waste of time because I think sometimes being able to prove or disprove false matter is useful, especially if an opponent hinges their entire case on a false claim. So if the entire argument is dependent on a false thing being true, and you can prove it false, prove it unlikely, say it's out of the realm of possibility, that's how you deal with it. The second thing is it is strategic though to assume it is true, obviously to a reasonable extent, if it's something that's just so out of this world, right? Like if someone claimed that Donald Trump was still president of the US today, um, that is so out of this world, that is definitely not true, you should not accept that information and do it even if. But let's say it's a more contentious claim, something that isn't 100% based on fact. For example, saying that the Chinese economy is bound to collapse at some point, right? That's something you could argue to be true. You could argue it's so far from reality. If you accept this and then explain why your side still wins, that is a very good strategic case that you can possibly make as well. Um, personally, for me, I don't think there's a solution for this in the debate, unfortunately, unless you could make a book of all the information that judges are allowed to know. Um, but that is so unfeasible, and there's no realistic way to do that. So honestly, that's the way you have to deal with false matter. I think that's one of the weaknesses of debating, and a weakness that I don't think debating can fix, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's all for that question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that's the last question for the section. Now I'm giving it back to Nico to do a uh, last section of the demonstration. So floor research. All right, cool. Um, so for this demonstration, I was asked to do a case build. Um, but I didn't want to start from scratch because I felt like if I did a case build and then I was just focusing on making the argument, I wouldn't really explain to you guys what's going on, right? Because I mean, in normal prep time, it's not like I'm explaining to people around me uh, my thought process, what's going on. I'm just typing or I'm saying things very quickly. So the compromise for this is I have a case build prepared and then I'm going to explain how um, I went about it and particularly how I insert the map. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to share a PDF now. So uh, the motion is this house would ban religious charities from proselytizing in the developing world. Um, and it's a normal case build. Uh, like, I guess you could go through it, but I would particularly want to focus on why is it that, or how is it that I use matter in this case, but oh, I want to clarify where I'm doing pop here. So I'm saying religious charities should proselytize in the developing world. Um, so the first claim here is that I set it up to show that religious charities aren't exploitative. Um, because I think what a lot of government side is going to say is that developing the developing world. Um, they're probably going to proselytize poorer areas of the developing world because they're more desperate. Uh, they want to coerce people to follow their religion. So they'll maybe give financial incentives. They might offer charities, schooling, etc. 
And therefore, these are people who don't actually want to convert to the religion, but out of desperation will convert to that religion. Um, so in this section, the goal here was to prove that they won't be as coercive, right? So the way um, I went about that was to say they're not going to be coercive because they have to, one, prioritize the good that they do because they need to be able to gain trust. So if you don't get the trust of the community, they might not let you in or other communities might not trust you. And therefore, you can enter a few communities, but other communities will see that you have ruined those communities, you are an active damage to those communities, they just want that even. And religions want to spread, right? Part of their goal is to convert as many people as possible. Therefore, trust is a very important aspect, right? And part of that is, could this coercion, could be an element of these religions will force their own, often Western, standards on developing countries, right? And there is an element of that. Um, but one argument I make here is that religions often decentralize and adopt folk aspects. And here's the method that I use here. And this is perhaps more so for illustration, maybe some degree of believability. So religions often adapt elements of local cultures to ensure people don't feel like they're turning away from their own identities to convert from their religion, right? Because when you're asking someone to convert religions, you don't want to make them feel like they're giving up their old life completely. So you still want to take on parts of their old life. Um, and in the Philippines, and I, I think in like a lot of the ways in which Catholicism has expanded in Africa um, was that it adapted Catholicism in the ways that these uh, areas used to believe in the old cultural beliefs. So in the Philippines, um, before the Spaniards came in the 1500s, there were religions that strongly believed in animism. So spirits, nature spirits particularly, not having one God, right? But believing that the things around you have a mystic element to them. Not one bigger God or higher power, right? Um, and the way Catholicism adopted that was it emphasized saints, more than they do in the Western world. Because saints give some element of believing there are many different figures, deities that you can look to without saying that they are God, but that there are many gods. It's a middle ground between this conception of one God in the West and multiple different mystical, magical spirits um, in the Philippines. So doing that made it easier to convert a lot of people into Catholicism. Because when you have saints, we have, and the Philippines are very celebrative of the feast days of saints. Um, we have a lot of spiritual practices where we, for example, have to tap or hold the same white uh, cloth onto some figures in order to be able to get a wish or to get a specific blessing. And these are the ways in which matter helps a judge understand this more. What is decentralization? How do you adopt elements of local culture? And in that case, what, what does that do for the argument? Here, I would say this. It helps, it helps the judge paint a picture in their heads. At the same time, it helps you believe to a greater extent what is the argument you're trying to make and why is it the thing you're actually doing? All right. So the first argument here was to say that religious charities are good. And having them enter areas that are maybe not so well off is a benefit. And to build that, what we uh, first do in this argument is to explain why is it that governments and businesses are not enough in these kinds of areas. Um, and I think you could say that these are geographic areas where politics and businesses both fail to address the needs of impoverished communities. And here's where more specific matter comes in. Because if you know how these communities work and how these communities are viewed, it helps you prove that all the alternatives the government side might explain for poverty alleviation would not have entered to begin with. So um, because a lot of these areas don't have um, skilled labor, um, a lot of businesses don't invest, or a lot of politicians might not cater to these communities because they might not vote very often, or they don't see them as a big enough voting bloc. Um, also, 
in a lot of poor areas, there is stigma around them. People think that they're crime-ridden, that they can't trust them, that they perhaps should have resources taken away from them when they're already so deprived. Um, so when that happens, what I'm doing here is drawing from experiences of uh, perhaps you know, my own experiences of how people view um, these communities, because this is the stuff that I see on the news. This is the stuff that I hear from other people. And thus, it builds the problem to a greater extent. It's an illustration that serves also as proof for why is it that poor communities, even if gov like the government side wanted a government or a business to step in, often can't have that because their problems compound and they make it even harder and harder um, when obviously this is unfair and unjust. And, uh, I'm just looking for other places where Panther could be uh, potentially used. Okay, here. Um, meaning and spirituality. So in this part of the argument, this part says that even if the religion doesn't provide a material benefit, to people in these areas, they can provide a meaningful spiritual benefit in these areas. And I think a strong example I didn't include here that I would use to illustrate this argument is that when you are faced with struggle, there are often questions of your own existence. There are questions of your own purpose and your meaning in the world, right? For example, uh, this is where I might insert some matter. There are many victims of natural disaster who and the question, what is the meaning of all of this? Why has all of this happened? Did I deserve this? Why has such an awful thing happened to me? And how do I bounce back from it? That sometimes, uh, definitely not all the time, and this is an argument I am making for this motion, not my own personal belief, but sometimes religion is what these people turn to in order to provide them a sense of meaning. That it's not something that they deserve and that there is something better for them in the future that there is still some higher power that is providing for them and ensuring they're going to be okay. And you can make the argument is the same here. If you are in a life that might be filled with strife or with struggle, being able to turn to religion is a particular benefit in that regard. So when you're able to construct meaning, sometimes your material reality doesn't change, but your spiritual reality, the way in which you perceive yourself and construct meaning can be a change that religion can't provide. And this is something I have learned um, from, uh, so in Ateneo, we are required to take theology classes because we're a Catholic Jesuit institution. Um, and because of that, I am taking from some of the readings that I've encountered and looking at how religion can potentially interact with disaster, with poverty, and with other traumatic or difficult experiences that people go through. Um, and drawing from this information that I've seen, being able to apply it in this setting, I think not just gives illustration power, but also some rhetorical power. It gives it some flair to what otherwise could have been a very, perhaps, maybe boring, maybe too analytic of an argument. Being able to use the example can allow you to gain some rhetorical flair back into being more compelling and ensuring that it's an argument that sticks uh, in the long term for judges. Now, um, if you have some matter, <laughs> you can actually disprove a lot of these arguments. So for example, if I'm on God, I would say religions are awful for developing countries. So here, Op is saying there are religious charities. On God, I'll say a lot of these religious charities don't do good. Because if you look at what these religions promote, they're often things that are bad for development. For example, these religions might promote um, abstinence rather than reproductive health rather than safe sex, rather than birth control, because those things are unnatural, they oppose God, etc. But really, being able to promote those things are very, very good for these communities, because you don't want children to be born out of accident. You want children to be planned. You want to make sure also that the people who are having children are adults, rather than in many of these communities. Sometimes the problems of teen pregnancy can be quite hard on young women. Um, but also that when you have too many people in one family, it becomes very difficult to provide. It often puts pressure on the older children to work and not 
all of that survive. So instead, funneling and focusing resources on one or two children could potentially be better than doing that for all of them. That's an argument you might only be able to make if you knew um, quite a bit about religion, what it promotes, how it works. Um, so that's it. Uh, I suppose that's the end of the demonstration. And, and thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. Thanks to everyone who came. Uh, I'm very appreciative of all the support and you know the, the passion for debating. That's something I can really respect. Uh, thank you all, and I hope to see you guys uh, in tournaments or somewhere else. Thank. Uh... Thank you, thank, thank you, Miko. We're really happy to having you, not to mention to all participation enthusiasm. And don't forget for all participants to fill up their Google form attendance. And should there be anything that uh, make you inconvenience or mistake, or maybe all of your interesting question might not be accommodated, we really apologize for that. So thank you everyone. Like this is the end of the ses uh, session. So. Keep stay tuned for the next workshop from Indonesia Debating Union. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, okay, uh, hello Miko, uh, firstly, really thankful for you, uh, having you he in here uh, in our workshop of Indonesia Trade Union, like how you feel? Uh, I super appreciate it guys, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, the invitation means a lot and I'm happy to have this thing. Uh, okay, uh, like maybe like other committees like Melov and Aldo, Jeffa, do you have like any other things that to say to Miko? Like, yeah, thank you, Miko, for coming and join with this debate. Uh, I mean, the words of I'm Melov who um, uh, message you on Twitter. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, okay, friend. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I just want to restate our appreciation because like we're super ecstatic that you would like to accept and hopefully maybe if we have like since we're like planning for like future events also like hopefully you're also willing to accept another invitation from us in the future. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, lastly, uh, could we like do a documentation with like with uh, only organizing committees like that? Okay, sir, uh, I'll do, could you do like, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll do like last documentation with this. All right, I'm gonna take the picture of all of us. Get ready, I'm gonna take it in three, two, one. One more time. And make it to the full screen. Wait a minute. Yes. Sure. 
Hi. All right, I'm really sorry. It's kind of noisy in my place. I, um, I hope it doesn't distract anyone. Like my voice is still audible, right? Cool. So I'm gonna continue to take a picture, and so we're gonna we're gonna take it in three, two, one. All right. It's all done. Okay, uh, last thing before, like, we are really, really, uh, going to end this, like, we could you have, like, any feedback for us? Um, not particular. Uh, I think I thought you guys handled the event very well, uh, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, I think, like, we could end this session right guys uh maybe like any other like one to tell another things if not okay so i think there is not uh nothing that we would like to say so yeah thank you miko uh thank you very much for this uh chances we're really, really happy for that thank you as well have a great evening guys see you see you thank you so much. thank you Aku tidak